I'll get to that later. <laughs> well, when I came to this school in 1965, knowing I was lazy and needed to go to a place that forced you to take five courses instead of four and make you get up on Saturday mornings for classes, um, one thing that was a rule was that dogs could come and, come and go wherever they please. So we had dogs in the classroom and students would take the dogs in on bad nights in their rooms. And we had mandatory chapel on Tuesdays. That was the equivalent of email. <laughs> and the uh, dean would give announcements and stuff. And the um, upperclassmen who were uh, wearing gowns and who ran the chapel and so forth saw to it that the doors were open and closed properly. One of them would almost always let one dog in particular in during chapel, a big German shepherd who loved a crowd and um, was an extrovert. Uh, he, he really, uh, he, he was, uh, he had to display a little bit. He would go up to one of the columns in front sometimes and salute when the dean was talking. And he had great credibility among the students. Uh, I notice there's a dog coming in and going out today since we don't have air conditioning right now. So, you know, what I used to love, I may get some of that, I don't know. Although, Steve had a cat that walked right around the whole time he was reading, and he either didn't know it or he showed great cool. I was just scared it was a skunk. <laughs> that happens here, too. Uh, let's see. Here are a couple of some of these. This is a, a book that I yeah, I have this tug of war with my editor every time I, I give him um, titles that I think are proper for the poems, and he says no, no, send me some more. And I remember one year he said, well, we had about a our son was four or five years old. He said, well, what would Ian call the book? I said, Ian's at school, I can't ask him. He said, well, what do you imagine he would call your book? I said, he, the run of the house, because that's what he has. And this guy, John Irwin, said, I like that. And so I got some more titles on Sent him along. I called him a few days later, and I said, now about that title, he said, forget it. It's run of the house. Marketing likes it, too. Uh, so this is, I think, will be called Couldn't Prove, Had to Promise, and a lot of these poems are really new. Uh, so I'm going to start with a couple of the latest and then poke around a little bit. This is called The Gladiator of Misgivings. The small boy with the booming voice whose father seemed forever on a trip knew what to do. We pushed the crates together, tumbled the cat-ruined carpet down the attic steps to the garage, then strung the Christmas lights and lettered signs that shorted Shakespeare of his final E. After that, Lionel Hickenbotham took the stage, telling us he was Prince Hall and we, we were those soldiers of the great events. Our audience was H's mother, who would sometimes read from Tennyson, having us repeat each line, repeat again. And there was also H's ancient aunt, who smiled and nodded yes to everything. But once, out on the vasty fields of France, even the ant had darkened thoughtfully as Hall looked back and said, All right, you bustards, charge. <laughs> then with our brooms and garbage lids, we did. Let's see. Um, there's a poem I may read later. Uh, from about the time our daughter was learning to play, ride a bicycle. I, if I read one about one child, I have to read the other, and these poems have been around forever. But um, this is one that's also really stems from our oldest child. It's called Rules. First day, first grade, two cut-ups laughing, 
shoving, shouting, till each called before the teacher's desk, knuckles wrapped and scolded back, the two act up again. Things went like that, first grade, first day, until the girl who sat between the two had raised her hand, announcing she was ill, which got her out and down the hall and safely to the nurse. Fourth time, same day, the school nurse telephoned, <coughs> then mother there, buckling her daughter. So each of them, front and back, eyeing the other in the mirror, till the mother, slowing, said, you can't go to the nurse every time some bad thing happens. And the mirror asked, where do you go? This is um, entitled Crescent Theater, Schenectady, New York. I don't think, well, I, I take that back. I, there, I, there, are, there is one other poem that I can think of that was written for somebody who, uh, at least for a while, was a college administrator. Uh, we have a dean who's just retired. He told me uh, about his grandfather, who was an immigrant from southern Italy, and uh, didn't really speak English much. And uh, his grandfather played the piano for the silent movies. He played at the Crescent Theater in Schenectady. And, um, but then all his kids were in the process of becoming American and so forth. Anyway, I heard that story four or five years ago, and I, this probably happens for a lot of you. You hear something, you can't do anything with it at the moment, but you have a feeling that you'll get around to it. So I wrote this, and, um, and I can read it now because this guy's retired as dean, and he isn't going to get after me. You know? <laughs> Thin silhouette below the screen. The best part was the way he nodded yes and kept up playing as the movie ran more or less in time with itself. That train converging on a washed out bridge or biplane spinning overhead or chaplain's cabin on the edge of so much gold or nothing, nothing said, only accompanied and always by some melody struck up between disaster this side, that side comedy, with everything eliding scene to scene. But now the camera's cranking so the landscape stutters while the biplane writes itself and Harold Lloyd hangs from his minute hand and Chaplin spins his cane and totters off. And then there is that bridge which means the train's rerunning in a flashback, therefore late for what's already happened next. Sparks rain out of reversing wheels. The worst must wait. As now the camera pans long distances, broad tinted fields, the end, old names, to which that silhouette keeps nodding yes, yes, to every last jittery frame. Then house lights up and closing down, he walks out with one melody stuck in his head. It circles round, so more refrain than melody. Some sympathy, captions won't explain. Whatever will. The new world's arguments through neighborhoods where something goes on filling bill billboards and windows or just what's understood when home he reads his foreign papers news, listening to his children using English for everything they wish, rain falling somewhere else. Let's see what else. A little short poem, I may have read this a few years back, Thin. Declaring war on household order, grabbing the apples, oranges, anything, then racing out, we had our own ideas of order. And Bill Burke's dad was dead, shaving in the marrow. This was 1955. Everyone else was still alive. 
What would they have us children do back then? We were very brave and very thin. When night came, deepening our windows, we saw it like the lost eyes of dark marrows. Night came, and we were brave to sleep again. Okay, those of you who, I have a theory about the airplane that disappeared a few months ago, that Putin had the KGB disappear the plane so CNN would cover that exclusively for five weeks while Putin took Crimea. <clears throat> I find there's a generation gap between those who laugh at that and <laughs> those who don't. Uh, this is uh, entitled Bluefin. It's just a short little thing. Lacking the bloodhound's rush to find what's lost, this one moseys through a darkness deeper than affection practices. Better it dive alone than we go down where pressure crushes, heart compresses, so enlarges what's still missing. And then um, we had, I read this, I think, last year when it was brand new, but we have a dog. He was coming through if he comes back. It's entitled Bad Dog. I don't wish this dog his his or her end, but uh, which happens here. But uh, this one's floppy and kind, just like the one described in the poem. Bad dog. He was a bad dog, and he did not care. <laughs> when nature called, he stood and lifted there. He chewed socks, rugs, and shoes the rungs of chairs, put on a leash, he locked his legs, he would not budge. Asleep, he barked and chased what was not there. Awake, he barked and chased what was not there. <laughs> when danger knocked, he shrugged. I see him still that way, facing the door, floppy and kind, wet nose against the glass, or scratching over ears where going bald, then sniffing round to find just where he lifted earlier. The which he did just once more when at last nature called and he followed. <laughs> Someone really objected to my killing the dog last year. But, uh, see, he's back, so it was all right. Let's see. Here's another animal poem um, called Checks and Balances. Lion paced his cage, then stood and roared till monkey screamed and climbed a tree. As though by this the two agreed that lion was carnivore and terror on the other side was what zoo paid him, fed him for. But monkey had a trick he had learned when smokers passed, he danced a fit with begging through the bars till one returned and handed him a cigarette, which he then puffed and studied as it burned, then flicked the butt just where the lion turned. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, here's some um, a little bit older poems. I think I got um, an email about 9 or 10 o'clock a number of years ago when Donald Justice died. It's longer than, than you think. Uh, Justice came here many times, and um, I sat down and roughed most of this out then. <clears throat> but I had, um, Justice had a, a spare style, and I wanted to do something 
that reflected that or echoed that a little bit, I suppose. And um, he taught himself to paint. He was a very good sight reader, and he originally studied composition with Carl Ruggles in Miami. So he had wanted to, and he did compose some music. Uh, so he had three sides. He was a fine poet, you know, wonderful stylist. He was um, started out writing formal poetry, then left that, then came back to it later. The, the years he was coming to Sewanee, I think he had returned to it. Um, and then he painted a lot, and um, and he, wherever he was, he usually wound up seated at a piano. It was better if we could find him a good one than a bad one. And um, this has, starts out, it's titled uh, Prudentius, Seneca, Boethius, etc. And it's uh, got a couple of, uh, I guess, junior high school uh, level translations of uh, uh, a line from Prudentia and, and one from Seneca that are uh, nothing uh, special about them at all. But uh, the one from Boethius, if I remember correctly, was um, the man who um, peers, I think, peers into the abyss, loses himself. And I, um, working on this uh, the following days, I changed that. The man who gazes at his shoes loses his glasses. But the rest of this is pretty heartfelt. Um, uh, Prudentius has, has a thing, in my 57th year, what use, you know, like life's over or something. I, that's right, this was written 10 years ago. I was 57, I'm 67 now. I ran across that line and Don had just died and I thought, oh, maybe I can use that. Boy, was I taking myself too seriously. Um, or pretentious too seriously. So in my 57th year, what use? Time devours all things, and the man who gazes at his shoes loses his glasses. And the music's calling no one back. The sky rains sparrows if you watch it long enough, but justice doesn't, and the music is silent. Sometimes the sky's a wren's egg blue of hope, a Chinese boneless watercolor blue, but then loose sparrows come cluttering and loud. In China, in Guilin, the fishermen set out by dark, gas lanterns suspended above the bows of narrow boats, floating the black reflective water like brief instances of someone rule, someone's rule that says it is displacement, gives memory its weight. The fishermen use cormorants, Necks ringed, so what they catch they cannot swallow. Cannot, in fact, but give, if only of displacement. The birds surface, release, then disappear. The bow lights drifting, opening the dark. The boats float out, then one by one come back to where the sky could rain a thousand losses and no one look up, nor hear any music. Justice is gone and no one plays that dark. Listen, but the cormorants dive silently. Listen for a long time, but what they do is silent. Only memory can hear. William Logan and Deborah Greger met in Donald Justice's poetry workshop, fell in love, and have been together ever since. So don't anybody discount the power of poetry. <laughs> this is albumin silver print from Glass Negative outside Chicago Station, 1887. And I, I found this at MoMA and uh, stuck in my head, so I had to do something about it. It's in three sections, and you'll hear a shift in pace as I go from one section to the other. <clears throat> Ghosts of the late Victorian stare like belief. 
their stern stopped mouths covering crooked teeth. The question is, what is it focus yields from faces in a gray receding field? That dry voluptuousness we call then, now acidly pale, composedly thin, or only these few half-expectant eyes arrested in the mute surprise of limb-shattering light and the absolute hushed ballistics of dry leaves underfoot. The train breathes and jolts full of expectation. The porters scurrying after their charges. Next, goodbyes, waves, one second enlarges, the whistle sounding exclamation. Later, a night with a birth and rhythmic sleep, then morning, the Midwest and porters again. Why will Americans believe what's plain as Sunday afternoon, but not the steep unfolding climb up to an altitude, rare as the Alps say, where beauty and war make geographic boundaries the core to a life safe enough for platitudes. And heroes here with their simplifying stories, they're seated backward on this train, seeing portraits of themselves forever sliding from view through headlines and hack histories. But of the dozen captured here, it seems, no heroes at all, only grandparents of grandparents and everyone intent on the next moment. Somewhere, a whistle screams. Soil transcends the amateur of beauty, the O's exclamatory duty to praise back into present tense absence, more vivid for its distance. As if the uneventful forfeiture caught here by lens and aperture, this telescoping, technically precise, arrested view could splice some small genetic yesterday with now. Restore the hero with the vow he will return, as though return were same, and not an arbitrary frame. Or just restore the common every day of travel, rest, and company. Turn what we lose always to new finding. Make harmony binding the way Ravel imagined it to be. Let landscape trail us musically and every portrait well taken take light again. Someone sometime earlier last week was talking about, uh, who was it? I do take notes. There's so many things that are worth remembering. It was, um, it may have been Alice talking about um, how to, um, uh, how to get out of a, a kind of sense of abandonment, moments of abandonment or despair. So anyway, this is, I was thinking of, um, oh, you know, some sort of shipwrecked person. It doesn't have to be, um, A modern could be contemporary or not, but I quoted Charles Darwin. Uh, Seeing the gradation and diversity of structure in one small group of birds, one might fancy that from an original paucity, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. And that's from the Beagle. But for the one marooned, all limits have reversed. So now the ocean's hourglass washes sand from underfoot wave after wave, and days allied, and word may never pass over that fixed horizon of great risk. The signal fires burn out, bottles drift back. In time, the lost forget that which they miss, as all the imitations that they make of civilized survival fail, unnoticed under the black domes of day following day. And this is how identities are erased, not in the violent wreck, but in the way time runs without exception or an end, limitless to exhume the days from years, as though return 
or how the world begins, and this one doesn't ever. All those fears one carries into sleep vivid for dark, and the contrast of waking memory now told forget. Like island birds whose marks reduplicate their mainland history, but never going back go on with all. That is the order of it, the going through, that double mind and nothing in the all continuing but what you see from you, horizon round, blank, staring blue ocean and sky, and you wondering why such things happen. They simply do. So next time someone new will wave goodbye, isolate species with no ship coming round. Yet of those changeful birds blown in by storms, frail colonials agreed to common ground, they fly freely and by surprising forms. Let's see. This is a celebration of folly. I think I read it last year, but I want to read it again. It's entitled Another Christmas Tie This Year. Another, and the poem comes right out of the title Another Christmas Tie This Year. That is green and red and longer than usual and worn by you over another Christmas dinner where you were smiling down the table and taking stock. You're 65, you've got your health, you've got your job, you like to work. Left and right, your smiling kids are out of school. They've got their health, their jobs, their plans. They say they like to work, they save. And tonight they are laughing with tears in their eyes. Far end, there is your wife laughing. She is beautiful in ways Jane Fonda never figured out. And so much younger too such that the both of you know who time comes will do the tucking in. And she will live on well because she is, well, she is younger than you. And so kind about the things she cannot change, like you. <laughs> not that you're not distinguished in your quiet world where you are far too modest ever to wear that rack of medals you deserve, but live instead as though some gray Olympian who likes to give the second place a second chance. And you are Chamberlain and Russell and Bird and Roland Kirk, Monk, Brubeck and the other Bird and Melville and Hardy enjoying a good laugh on a sunny day. You are the hidden redwood in your side yard's undergrowth bordering a cul-de-sac of grave reflection where your neighbors never park their cars quite right. And you do not mind that always you must look down a bit to see these things. No, really, the only worry about your looking down just now might be to find some small spot of something on your brand new tie. Until in order to say grace, Hands rising to your lap, you do look down, bowing your head while a grave moment stretches through your family's silence. You look down and see, in fact, there is no spot on your tie, no spot at all, because while sitting down, you let the tie sink into the gravy boat where it has settled and lost the long, flat bow of holly with red berries it was meant to represent. There it is, stilled and changed above your washed and separate hands, which now you join, saying grace anyway, and meaning it a little more than would have been the case with only a small spot on your tie. <laughs> Let's see. I have, I'm not going, I'm going to read a couple of, a little bit from a long poem that maybe some, I'll read all together some year, maybe earlier uh, in the, this gathering. It's, um, it's called Nod, and uh, it's in four sections. This is just a little bit of the second section. There's a, um, a, a guy who's somewhere between a Georgia cracker and um, a kind of, um, oversimplified Mephistopheles. He's, uh, he, he 
is such a skeptic that he can be, at times he is right about the future. He's convinced that nothing goes well, and things do go badly sometimes, and that makes him absolutely right, it seems, when those things happen. He, he doesn't, he suffers. He's the voice of dis disappointment, and he, um, he doesn't believe anything really good can happen. Um, but every now and then he comes out a little bit, and his name is Floyd Byram Thatch, but people only call him Floyd. And I was just going to read a few, a page or two, two pages, three pages of this, just to get a little bit of the, the noise that goes on between these two guys. The, the fellow who begins and has the last word um, is younger. He's stuck in a, a, a parking lot outside Atlanta, Georgia. So it's uh, on the 3rd of July. And there's just not much... Uh, good to say about his life at that time and he's, he himself is nostalgic for older forms of order but he knows better uh, so Floyd has said uh, you know my honest name is Byram Thatch but no one's ever called me anything but Floyd and uh, the young guy says alright alright I said so Mr. Thatch so Mr. Floyd and now the two of you staring out from under the same fedora we're talking early blooms and sunlight where a building's wall will block the wind and let today pretend it is tomorrow we're talking why the front door opens from the back is why the what not ends with not when get comes second and forget we're saying reflect you now upon the deepening silence found in a sea of trouble and by that mean sometimes there's more but then it Again, sometimes there's less. Just like you better watch those mice who growing fat suggests the rats are gone as promise always begs another slice. Which is to say, Floyd, standing here, you're better off than Byram over there. I nodded off to where a tall shape leaned, filling the pet store's window, sidewalk window. It sidled, stopped, looked in, shifted, looked again, hand shading eyes and arms against the glass. Then it was moving fast headed for the double doors. I'll stop and say, Floyd uh, is a scary guy in some ways, but he is totally dominated by a wife. He's fearful of her, and she comes in and chews him out a couple of times, and uh, she's heading his way, and this fellow's trying to warn him. So Byram, so Floyd, I said, picking it up, there's one thing more you might allow. If all you've ever heard is Floyd instead of Thatcher, Byram Thatcher, say Floyd Byram Thatcher, well then that may just be the thing you bet your breakfast you will hear most anywhere, as the finch will chatter in one light, but the swallow winks you from another. It therefore seems right and fitting, or it fits about right, or it is right about like this. It fits to say that all those hurricanes and twisters, those floods and wrecks and salt waves you report, they're more like hyphens than what happened. And then Floyd gets his dander up, and he does a little riff back, and um, he says he's everything he said he was. Uh, hey, hey, he said, eyes narrowing like Stillwell staring the bastards down. You don't have socks without some feet, no hat, but got some noggin. I'm everything I said I was, and truth remains. There was, in fact, that cyclops of a hurricane. Then nodding up and down and side to side as though confirming yes and no at once, Floyd said, I meant things like the Goonie Bird and how we thought up Burma Shave. I meant so many things and most of them like laughter on long porches in warm weather or the rhythms of a rail car swaying under a full moon, flooding fields, or an old man snoring the deep down hall where the good dog curls with stopping the door. I meant the way we say, e gads, good grief, gadzooks, or yo, Vinny, get a load of that stuff passing, would you? And so on. So, he's still with us, I can just tell you that. Let's see. Um, this is an early poem. Um, sequence. Sang off key so mouthed the words, looked judicious when he couldn't hear what he forgot claimed he didn't need, avoided mirrors and biographies, read the sports and rarely finished, never listened but liked to talk, pushed when the door said pull, eavesdropped on telephones, blew his nose on linen napkins, had a dog he couldn't call, built a house he didn't finish, had a job he never named, Thought his father's life was sad. Chewed rubber bands, sucked spaghetti, 
parked in handicapped slots, jammed the meter with slugs, backed without looking, braked on ice, and sometimes late at night drove on the wrong side laughing, laughing on the wrong side all the way home. <laughs> a very uh, fine former, uh, well, a, a professor here when I first came back uh, generated that poem, and it wasn't you, Bill Clarkson. <laughs> Children's a Child's Christmas, sorry, in Georgia, 1953. I grew up in Athens, Georgia, and my father was a geographer there. But he did a, a stint at Northwestern, and so I knew the two different worlds a little bit that way. Everybody in that town lived in two different worlds. It was a university town, uh, and yet it was uh, before Martin Luther King or any of that, so it was the, the deep south before integration. Um, and what else? This little, this little fellow mishears things um, and there's mention of the Talmadge's drive, uh, Herman Talmadge and before that his father Eugene Talmadge and they ran, um, they ran against e each other for uh, governor. Herman Talmadge was senator from Georgia for a long time and his father was a, a, a milder version of what Huey Long was. Um, and Herman did not beat his father in the election for the governorship but father died before he could be sworn in uh, so Herman said I finished second and he occupied the governor's mansion they finally got him out and he later became a very effective senator for Georgia um, what else is in here uh, this when I was I can remember going to Atlanta when Delta Airlines was just a bunch of old surplus World War II DC-3s they Delta started out as a um, a crop dusting uh, outfit in Louisiana before World War II. So this is a little boy. Uh, it's, and I wrote the poem, uh, when I wrote it, I remember the thing I was interested in was that kind of inversion you see sometimes around Christmas time. People are not feeling very happy the rest of the year when everything is full of colored lights and everybody's being cheerful and or when people are really exhausted because they've been driving all day with the kids in the back seat squabbling. Um, all of that, all the uh, increased expectations uh, of a holiday <clears throat> like that with all the travel, sometimes it seems flat to people so that they, uh, the world looks happy and they feel bluer than they ever would simply by comparison. I was sort of thinking about that and I also wanted to be, um, I wanted to do something about uh, Dylan Thomas being just, I thought, a little a little too cheerful about his Christmas. I grew up in Georgia and it was different. <clears throat> um, there was a, the Union troops sang a song when they went through Georgia burning down key spots, uh, marching through Georgia. I should say, if you want to understand Sewanee a little bit, not just that Rebels Rest burned down and we'll build it back up, the, the one thing that would really set people off would be the chapel, but Rebels Rest is getting a lot of support too. But um, when I was a freshman here, my roommate, I uh, was from Rome, Georgia, and one of the prized possessions that family has is a big photograph of General Sherman and all of his staff having tea out in my former roommate's front yard in Rome, Georgia, where his great-grandfather was making sure General Sherman was comfortable on his way through Georgia <laughs> and, not, and not torching Rome. <clears throat> so people can compromise in this part of the world. Child's Christmas in Georgia, 1953. Marching through Georgia to bed, he stopped, listened, and heard while shepherds washed their socks by night. Later, he sang the same skewed line off key, and his parents howled. Until getting it wrong, he decided, beat getting it right. But Christmas Eve, they read about killing the firstborn, fleeing the land, and returning by another country till he couldn't sleep and had to check so slipped from bed to stare the darkened height by which the wise men steered. Downstairs, there were his mother's stacks of albums and mantle high, her unblinking gallery of gold frame gray beards gazing and matriarchs in black scowling the generations back into place. And then there were the others, his infant older brother who never came home Two cousins lost in war, an uncle who captained his ship over the flat world's edge, 
and one fleece line pilot lost years now inside the stilled weather of a relative's box camera. And then there were the lines he had heard in church, pray that your flight may not be in winter. So that was how the pilot disappeared and woe to the pregnant and nursing. So that explained his brother or their mother. There was one thing he knew by heart by now. Rubella cooked, cleaned, and scolded her way through the house, tuning the news and talking back, though she didn't vote and said her baby died because he wouldn't come out in Georgia. Still standing there and staring up, he pressed his face till the cold glass fogged and hurt his nose, though there was only, only the street light yellowing side yard and his father's dormant garden and the Talmadge's coiled drive and empty house. So what were they singing about, the records and radio? And why all these presents when over drinks his parents grieved those missing? What was given if you had to go away and wound up framed like a silent question? In the morning, Rubella would light the stove. The paper boy would whistle up millage, tossing the new day high over the hedge into another, into another by the porch for parents who ignored their food and read to themselves. So, still at the window, he studied the sky figuring Pontius Pilate flew for Delta and that the two parts to the Bible were the Old and New Estaments, which, like Christmas, you read out of the names of those missing. <laughs> anyway. Uh. Yeah, it's, there are some funny things in it. Um, Let's see. Where are we on time? This is a... Uh, sounds grim to some people, but uh, I have a few friends who are... I, I would describe them, I suppose, as rigorous Roman Catholics. And... Um, they they don't find they they think probably finally in the end it's a positive poem but some people are not sure. <laughs> the first year I read uh, in 1990, the staff filled one of these up with vodka, and I drank a, a big gulp out of it and turned red in the face. And all I could say was, "This water's adulterated." <laughs> And they've been working on that. There's another one here that would make me whistle if I got to it. This is called An Early Guide to Trapping. And this is one of those uh, that they happen every now and then. This is one I got up in the middle of the night and kind of roughed it out. And it, just stay with me to the end. <clears throat> Whether your industry be pelts for fashion, the trials of sport, riddance of pests, or finding food, the first rule is your unobtrusiveness. The second, except for pestilence, is that you cause small injury, as any hurt will render animals less valuable. Tend your traps. A fouled device is wasted ingenuity, and, the esca and escape the spent in engine of diligence. And know that those once caught by limbs may gnaw themselves free, walking after on three legs, and ever wary of your instrument. Any slight in practice lessens chance of prize. Prompts atten prompt attendance answers this. The idea of one trap is no idea, as best results will always come in numbers, allowing you to find in series what no single bait can ever fetch. Remember, range is hunger and supply, so set your lines accordingly, crossing all customary paths. Movement is your friend. Since nocturnals make your fortune while you sleep, yet let sleep be model and reminder that the landscape also rests and will be crossed and its encounters made your benefit. 
As to your traps, clean them of incident. Even you and your particular may foul, and understand that quiet suits you best. As the set jaws, nets, doors, boxes, and pits of your engines readily display. Waiting is the final instrument. Learn that and make it your advantage. Look for wet season when populations grow, and meeting the face of imposed idleness count the future as long gain. Memorize the graduals that water takes as thirst can be a steady ally and underbrush the sight of much traffic. Except when facing certain deprivation, see that you pull your traps by spring. The captured kit or fawn is small reward compared to later enterprise. Be systematic in your work and avoid distraction over painful signs, the enlarged stare, extended legs, set mouth, as suffering will touch all animals, however long or cannily one skirts that fire. As you would teach your children caution, what to expect, where not to step, how sorrow follows error, how griefs a backward pain without relief, perfect yourself in every watchfulness. Food comes to the focused eye and hunger focuses, while living in hours only means hours. And to those traps filled and waiting you be prompt to clear, rebate, and set, and never let the signatures of grief, whether met firsthand or written by escape, dissuade you from refinement of purpose as you will increase by every good form of patience. That would make a great nighttime story for a six-year-old, wouldn't it? <laughs> our, uh, our son was always kind of a handful, as people who've lived here for a while know, a good handful. And we were uh, in Vermont one time and coming out of a restaurant, he'd been acting up a lot. And some dog had gotten into the dumpster dumpster and pulled out the rib cage or side of beef or something so there's some ribs there in the grass just that were pretty well picked over and he was just you couldn't do anything with him and he said what's that dad i said that's the last little boy who came to this restaurant and wouldn't behave <laughs> <laughs> okay uh this, this is uh this is a marriage poem. I've read it re recently, uh, every summer, last two summers anyway. Um, I read it for our 39th anniversary, and then when our 40th came around, I thought, well, that's even better. I'll read it for that, too. And that's going to be the 41st, and I thought, well, I'll read it again. Uh, <clears throat> reading the map. Whatever bearing you select, Eventually, your path will intersect such variance in elevation, you will find you need a topographic map for where things lead. Brunton, pocket transit opened. Orient yourself so compass rows, legend, and coordinates confirm the route you've picked. That done, pack up, set out. Following the arguments of contour lines from rock and rise to water and decline to where, in order to be accurate, cartography exaggerates. By scale, that bridge your map identifies should be invisible, but there it lies, as bold in print and pixel wide as the hurried river it divides, past which the landscape's slow relief devolves with roll and slip beneath every step you take, following a trail that, in order to be read, is inaccurate to scale. As map and compass make one motion, out of strike, dip, fault, contact, and foliation, weaving and woven where roads and bridges are the duplicates of valleys, ridges, every aspect arguing some other, as love intends and maps assume, two put together even when just one is represented. This road, that bridge, or you, could you be printed, clearly standing out of scale, yet there you are, 
ready for imagination's little car, driving a world that turns into whatever confirmations you pass through. A landscape written uppercase and in bold print like memory and traced even where there are no pixels, even as reading the map, love is invisible. And I'll finish with a short poem entitled Ad Lib, and um, it's, the, it's lifted really from my brother-in-law who was dying last fall, had had cancer for a long time, and I cannot describe him adequately when I say that he was a perfected curmudgeon. Uh, his grandson came over when he was four or five years old. His grand, the grandson, uh, uh, our nephew, uh, can control a conversation for a long time. Anyway, he came over to his grandfather who was busy uh, talking and uh, didn't want to be interrupted. And he turned to the little fellow and he said, go away. <laughs> and uh, other things like that. But um, he, he really... Um, you know, he softened, he was, he was lovable way down, way down well hidden, he was always lovable, and he softened uh, outwardly as he uh, reached the end uh, and said some of these things about himself, ad lib. Just told he had six months, he said, a fat old sedentary diabetic such as me, I could have caught a heart attack last Saturday and now get six months added. Visits ended with his laughing at the finches circled round his feeder, groundling squirrels elbowing under, and crows who proved unable to stop scolding. Something silent went on eyeing while the sun confirmed one angle, then another, and trees collected in the shade they gave each other. And once, as we were laughing, he called after, Sorry, and once as we were leaving, he called after, I enjoy seeing you so much, sometimes I forget I'm dying. No, that's not it. What I mean is sometimes there's some part of me stops dying. So, and that's the reading. Thank you all for being here. This, this is very nice. Thank you for standing up. But I'll just tell you, if you stood for me this afternoon, when Jill gets through reading, you're going to have to levitate. <laughs> uh, See you tonight. We're not done yet. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. I hate things like this. No. <laughs> now, listen. You know, uh, everybody can sit down for a moment. We just thought, this guy deserves to be recognized for 25 years of making the best literary community in this country. We have, we have a small token of our gratitude, and um, we thought we probably need to hear a few words from uh, the wisest person in the room, and that is Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was going to write something. Morris came up to me and said, we're going to do this thing, and we would like you to speak. So I thought, oh, okay. And then I thought, wait a minute. They just want to get me up here. But no, you really want me to say something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Well, I had only written sort of a chronicle of the writer's conference. So I guess all I can say, it's been quite a trip. <laughs> <laughs> 
and thank you all. I, I guess uh, we've gone from many places. I, I asked Wyatt this morning. I tried to um, make it as though I was just saying by the by. I said, now, who were the first people on the faculty? <laughs> what, what were they? And not thinking that he'd remember, but yes, in fact, he did. And because I memorized that, I guess I could tell you that the first people on the faculty in fiction were Tim O'Brien, Robert Stone, Mary Ann Ginger, and Ellen, Ellen Douglas. Douglas. And the first people in poetry were Charles Martin, Howard Nimeroff, um, Mona Van Dyne, and Emily Grossaltz. And in playwriting, it was Tina Howe and Wendy Hammond. Mm -hmm. So I got that far, <laughs> and I guess um, we went through many places where we had this conference. Uh, we ate in the cafeteria that was over the BC, the right. BC yeah. and uh, it did not have a salad bar. <laughs> it did have those dispensers where you got uh, Fruit Loops and Cheerios <laughs> at one end and soft serve at the other. And uh, our son, Ian, uh, would get himself a ice cream cone and would get his friend Horton Foot one every <laughs> night. Yeah. So then we moved to the inn. Yeah. And then we moved to this amazing new inn. And I guess I'd say through all that time, We've had this family of extremely talented friends. So thank you all. Thank you.